Hey everyone, and welcome to episode six of Diversity of Life with. Uh, huh, uh, uh, uh. I see. That worked out better than expected. Sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled broadcast, but welcome to Diversity of Life, episode six, with me, Mad Nancy. <laughs> So for this week's episode, I'm going to be enlightening you on what befell poor Nassi here. He was subject to a little parasitoid experiment of mine. Some of you may know this life strategy from the alien movies. The aliens also happen to be parasitoid organisms. There are many types of parasite organisms. They are characterized by feeding off of a host, but is different from predation as they, one, often don't kill the host, and two, feed off the host for an extended period, keeping them alive. A parasitoid is a unique type of parasite that actually ends up killing the host, but different from predation, it still feeds on the host for an extended period and often occupies the host for a significant portion of its life. Parasitoids exist almost nearly every taxa, from plants to animals to microbes. One of the plants that we use as a Christmas decoration, mistletoe, is a parasitoid. It grows on and siphons the nutrients out of tree species, resulting in the death of the tree. This is an example of an ectoparasitoid, or one that feeds and lives off of the outside of the organism. The classic example of the chestburster aliens is an endoparasitoid, or one that lives inside the organism. The parasitoidal organism grows inside the host, feeding on nutrients until either the host runs out of nutrients or the organism becomes mature, and then the parasitoid just needs to exit, resulting in the host's death. So aliens got it pretty spot on with the chestbursters. They took inspiration from real life living organisms. These parasitoid organisms have to overcome numerous obstacles in the host, which is what makes the evolution of this life strategy so amazing. Some of these obstacles include finding a way inside the host, they have to fight the immune system of the host. They have to survive nasty chemicals floating around the organism. They actually have to find the host. They have to find a way to breathe inside the host. And on top of all of this, they have to compete with other parasitoids inside the organism or even their own siblings. On this last point, some cool research and one of my favorite experiments came out of this. Research by Harvey, Pullman, and Tanaka in 2003 found that the inside of the host became like a Hunger Games. Siblings killed each other to be the one that emerges from the host. Talk about some kind of horror show. Another key obstacle on that list is just how do they get inside the organism? This is often a result of oviposition. Simply defined, oviposition is the act of laying an egg. But in the parasitoid's case, it is the act of laying an egg by injection or burying inside of the host organism. Yeah, it really is kind of gross and unpleasant as it sounds. Sorry, Nassie. The most successful group of organisms to use oviposition is the insects. There are literally hundreds of thousands of species of parasitoids in the insect class. Of these insects, the hymenopterans, whose evolution is most deeply rooted in parasitism. That's right, the bees, ants, and wasps all started as parasitoids. And I know what you're thinking. Mad Nassie, does that mean that every time I'm stung, I become a mom to some baby bees? All the bees inject is venom, but millions of years ago, they injected eggs. We know this because of the phylogenetic history of the hymenopterans, or the story that their DNA tells us. Approximately 80% of the diversity in the whole group of bees and wasps and ants is solitary parasitoid wasps. These wasps have a stinger-like appendage, the ovipositor, that they use to inject eggs into a host. So based on how the genes changed over time, scientists have been able to show that as the bees, ants, and wasps became eusocial, that started to bring prey back to share with the members of the same species. And then rather than laying the eggs inside the organisms, they started to lay them outside so that the larvae could feed entirely on the organism. But how do you make sure that the prey item or the host doesn't eat your babies? Well, you paralyze them, and that's just what venom is for. Bees are the exception because they further evolved into feeding on nectar and pollen, so the venom just became a defensive mechanism. So the stinger is just a repurposed ovipositor. What about the other 80% of the hymenopterans? As I said, they're all still parasitoids and are amazing. The most common host for these parasitoid wasps are larvae such as grubs, Cubs, caterpillars, and maggots. And this brings us to the other three points on that list. Just how do they survive within the host? Well, that's a matter of coevolution. The wasp became so specialized to the hosts that there are often only one parasitoid wasp species for a specific host species. 
And that's why the hymenopterans are so diverse. There could literally be one wasp for every larval organism. This co-evolution with hosts has resulted in some crazy morphological adaptations, such as super long ovipositors. As you can see here, there are even some wasps known as hyperparasitoids. These are parasitoid wasps that parasitize the parasitoids living in another organism. It's parasitoid inception. Hymenopterists or the scientists that study hymenopterans have documented cases where there are five levels of hyperparasitism. This is crazy. And it means that there is a parasitoid of a parasitoid of a parasitoid of a parasitoid of a host. And last but not least on the list is how do they find the host? Especially in the case of hyperparasitoids, how can an organism potentially kilometers away know that there is the right species of parasitoid living inside a host? Well, to that degree, we actually have no idea as scientists. None, not a zilch. There is some evidence that wasps may be able to feel grubs in wood or smell caterpillars not too far away, but just how hyperparasitoids know that a host is inside of a caterpillar, we have no idea. But you want to know the most amazing thing about parasitoid wasps? They could be the future of agriculture and pest control. As these parasitoids only feed on a specific host, there is little chance of invasion of this parasitoid into the local ecosystem, especially in the cases of greenhouses. These parasitoids have been shown to be highly efficient controls of caterpillars and aphids and the like. And you don't even get the nasty byproducts that come with pesticides. They are even commercially available right now for select pest species. All you do, order a container of these wasps put them in your greenhouse and let them do their thing. One last thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that wasps can sometimes influence the behavior of the host, but uh, that's pretty close to my next experiment. So I'll just leave that for next time. As always, Nasi wants to hear from you. Did you know that aliens is a real thing? Are you spooked? Kudos to the few smart cookies in the comments that identified the topics for this and next week. Also, do you think Nasi's gonna be all right? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you liked what you saw here, hit the like button. If you want to see more, hit the sub button. And if you want to see more of my furry antics, go check out my Twitter. I hope you all enjoy a frightful Friday the 13th. And until next time, boils and cools, be careful when you're caring for a caterpillar because you just might get a wasp. <laughs>